Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 37, The Two Grooms. This week the Wheel of Fortune will turn again, tumbling our anti-hero Henry IV down from the heights he had so recently scaled. We will see him sink to the point of utter despair, and all that because a 43-year-old woman marries an 18-year-old. Before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Stephen and Jay who've already signed up. We should probably start with a quick recap where we are in the year 1090. Things aren't looking too bad for Henry IV. He has a modicum of control over most of Germany. The 17-year-long war with the Saxons had been brought to an end, largely by giving them what they wanted, but peace is peace. In Italy, his bishops were, by and large, in charge of the northern part of the country, and his antipope Clement III was on and off in control of Rome. As for his enemies, there were three main centers. In Swabia, the deposed dukes of Bavaria and Carinthia, Welf IV and Berthold of Zeringen, kept on fighting. Henry had entered peace negotiations with both, but their demands were unacceptable. They required the antipope Clement III to be removed and they themselves reinstated as dukes. The second key enemy was the great countess Matilda of Tuscany, one of if not the most formidable woman in 11th century Europe. Matilda had been reigning an area of northern Italy ranging from near Verona down to the Papal States, including important cities like Mantua, Lucca, Pisa, Modena, Reggio and Florence. Matilda had been at war with her imperial kinsman and overlord since at least 1082, though the conflict dates back to the marriage of her mother to Godfrey the Bearded in 1054. She had stood loyally with her friend Pope Gregory VII until his very end at great personal expense. At times she had been reduced to her indomitable mountain fortresses around Canossa and even needed to melt down her gold and silver treasures. But once Henry had left Italy, Matilda could free herself from the encirclement and won a great victory against the Lombard bishops at Sobrara. That brought her back into the previous position as the most powerful secular ruler in Italy. And finally, there was the Gregorian papacy. After Gregory VII had died in 1075, his remaining cardinals refused to recognize Pope Clement III, the man Henry had elevated to the seat of St. Peter. Instead, they elected one of their own as Pope Victor III. Barely ever had anyone been so reluctant to become Pope as Pope Victor III. He had been the abbot of the great monastery of Monte Cassino, it was founded by St. Benedict, and under his leadership it had become the foremost seat of learning, literature, arts and monastic life in Italy. He had not just been an outstanding abbot, but also a great negotiator on behalf of the church. He had good relations with his neighbours to the south, the Normans. It was thanks to his efforts the initial agreement between the papacy and the Normans came about in 1059, and he also helped bringing Robert Giscard to Rome in 1084. But Victor III was a realist, not a fanatic, like Gregory VII. He knew too well that after what Giscard had done to Rome, the Romans would not voluntarily accept the Gregorian Pope. And that meant getting into Rome was only possible in the train of a Norman army. But what is a Pope whose authority comes from the bloodied swords of Northmen and their Saracen soldiers? Well, not one Victor III aspired to be. Having resisted the election for a year, he was finally coerced into accepting it in Rome. But just four days later, before he could be consecrated, he had to leave the holy city as riots had broken out. He returned to Monte Cassino and put the papal vestments into the bottom drawer. There he remained as an elected but not consecrated pope for another year, before the Normans again smashed into the holy city. Victor III was finally consecrated. The Romans were still unconvinced of the benevolence of the papal allies, and so Victor III had to run away after ten days and hid in Monte Cassino again, before the Normans dragged him back into Rome in June. 
He stayed a month before claiming he needed to go home for health reasons, and then he died in Monte Cassino in September 1087. So that should have been that. By now the Gregorian papacy had proven to be nothing more than a Norman plaything. The anti-pope Clement III could hold at least parts of Rome and enjoyed the support of the local population. Clement III was also not against church reform per se, so that the urban population saw some of their demands to get a better sort of vicar fulfilled. The reason the Gregorian ethos survived owed a lot to Victor III's successor, Pope Urban II. He became Pope in 1088 and, since Rome was in the hands of Clement III, was elected and consecrated in the stunningly beautiful but tiny city of Terracina, halfway between Rome and Naples. Urban II had grown up in France, son of a local aristocrat in Champagne, and had joined the fabled monastery of Cluny. He rose through its ranks and was made prior of the abbey. In 1080, Pope Gregory invited him to become Cardinal Bishop of Ostia, the highest ranking member of the College of Cardinals. Urban II shared Gregory's view. The role of the papacy as the preeminent institution of Christendom superior to kings and emperors. But where he differed was in his methods. Where Gregory was rigid and doctrinal to the last, Urban II had the polish and the diplomatic finesse that was needed to get the papacy out of the hole Gregory had dumped it in. First order of service was to get out of the dependency on the Normans without irritating them. On that front he was lucky as Robert Giscard died in 1085. His successor as Duke of Apulia was Roger Borsa. Borsa means money bags in English, suggesting he had less ambitious goals than his father and was more interested in counting and recounting his money. Leadership of the Normans fell to Roger I, Count of Sicily, the youngest of the twelve brothers of Robert Giscard. Roger had been busy conquering the islands of Sicily since 1063. Sicily had been an Arab emirate since the 10th century, but had broken apart in the 11th into small warring factions, which created the opportunity for Roger. By 1090, he had removed the last of these mini emirs and set out to conquer Malta. What I'm saying is that Roger was busy consolidating his rule over Sicily and less in need of a pet pope. Urban then applied the good old rule that my enemy's enemy is my friend and concluded that in order to get rid of Clement III, he needed to remove Henry IV, and that means he needed to forge a coalition of all of Henry's enemies. And that coalition came about in the form of a marriage. A marriage that would even today raise some eyebrows. Urban II's proposal was simple. Matilda of Tuscany should marry the son of Welf IV, leader of the German opposition. That would give the anti-Henry forces control over a coherent area stretching from the borders of the Papal State all the way north across the Alps into Switzerland and southern Germany. Henry IV and his Pope, Clement III, could be shut out of Rome. Sounds great. Only issue was that Matilda of Tuscany was no spring chicken anymore. At 43 years of age she had little chance of further offspring, which was, according to the doctrine of the Church, the main purpose of marriage. And then Matilda's track record as a wife had not been quite in line with the expectations of the time. She had separated from her first husband, Godfrey the Hunchback, after a short marriage. The marital differences had come less from the lack of mutual attraction, but from her reluctance to grant him political control over her rich lands. Matilda very much took the view that these lands were hers and hers alone, and that no man, husband or otherwise, were to command them. To put that into context how unusual this is, it took until 1963 before Italian women were allowed to hold a public office that was contested by a man. So for an 11th century red-blooded nobleman, Matilda as a wife was a nightmare. And now, let's talk about the groom. His name was Welf V, son of, guess it, yes, Welf IV. Not only was his name unimaginative in the extreme, but he was also no more than 18 years old. The logic of the union was blatantly obvious, it barely needs explaining. The lands of Matilda were to fall into the hands of the Welf family upon her soon-to-be-expected demise, making the deposed Dukes of Bavaria the most powerful princes in the empire. Matilda was not keen. But a silver-tongued Urban II convinced her that she had to make this very last sacrifice 
for the cause of God and the papacy. Young Wealth V presumably was told to grin and bear it for a few years. The betrothal of this unlikely couple took place in 1089. With the announcement of the nuptials, all peace negotiations between Henry IV and the southern German opposition ended. War was to resume. The question was, where? Henry IV could either continue his operations in southern Germany and subdue the Welf and their allies, leaving Matilda well alone until that was resolved. Or he could go down to Italy, knock out Matilda, and end the schism once and for all by capturing Urban II. Option two was bolder, and we know a Henry, for him, bolder is better. He appears in Italy in May 1090 at the head of a sizable army. This time he brought along some of his German followers, including Frederick von Hohenstaufen, his son-in-law and closest ally. That suggests he was looking to make Italy the place where the final battle was to be fought. Equally, Wealth V joined his new wife in Tuscany, together with a contingent of his German allies. As before, Henry can count on the support from the Lombard bishops, though their numbers are somewhat depleted as the Archbishop of Milan had changed sides. Henry also no longer commanded the cities of Pisa and Lucca, who had returned into the fold of Matilda, having received all they needed from the Emperor. Hostilities the first year are taken up by the siege of Mantua, forever one of the military linchpins of Italy. Mantua barred the way to the heart of Matilda's possessions south of the Po River. After 12 months of siege, the city yielded and Henry entered in triumph. Two further strongholds nearby fell too, opening the road down to the Po River. This success was significant enough for Welf, the fourth father of Matilda's husband, to resume peace negotiations. It seemed to him the marriage alliance had failed to yield the desired benefits. And with some of his supporters amongst the bishopric having passed his last year, it was time to look for a compromise. But as before, Welf's demands were twofold. Return the Duchy of Bavaria to me and abandon your anti-pope Clement III. With Henry now in an even better position than two years before, he saw no reason to accept these demands and by summer 1091 hostilities resumed. The year ended with another success for Henry. Matilda had sent out a thousand of her knights to capture the emperor she had been informed was travelling with a small contingent close to her lands. Well, it was a trap, and her soldiers were routed by a much superior imperial force. And at that point Matilda did what she had done previously when things had turned against her. She returned to her string of fortresses around Canossa and employed a defensive strategy. So in spring 1092, Henry began to systematically besiege and break these fortresses. First Montemorello, then Montalfredo, and when these were taken, he proceeded on to Monteviglio. There were around nine strongholds around her heartland of Canossa. Having lost two and one on the verge of going, Matilda's vassals became concerned and wanted to bring this process to an end. Matilda was initially reluctant, but negotiations had to begin in October 1092. But they went nowhere. A hermit called John showed up and declared in a vision that Matilda would prevail and salvation was close at hand. So the vassals stopped the negotiations. I usually do not set much store by hermits, but this one was right. After the failure of the peace negotiations, Henry feigned a retreat towards Parma, but doubled back to attack Matilda's home and the heart of her defensive system itself, Canossa. When Matilda got wind of where Henry was going, she left the castle with most of its garrison and moved a few miles down the road to another of her castles, Bianello. It might well be that Henry thought that Matilda and most of her soldiers were still inside the castle of Canossa when he arrived, or he might have thought that she had already left and were now somewhere far away. What she was not aware of was that they were just round the corner in Bianello. In any event, on a foggy afternoon, Matilda's garrison came down from Bianello whilst the troops inside from Canossa attempted a sortie at the same time. In the dark and foggy chaos, Henry's troops had a hard time distinguishing friends from foe, and the most dispiriting moment came when Matilda's soldiers captured the royal banner, creating panic in the royal army. Henry fled the site of his now second humiliation and took his remaining army north. News of his defeat travelled fast, 
and two of the fortresses he had only just captured were returned to Matilda, and in one of them was the imperial train with supplies and the campaign funds. Christmas was a difficult feast for Henry, who had lost most of the progress he had made that previous year. And at the same time, his German enemies also smelled the morning air. Berthold von Sering had himself elected Duke of Swabia, though there was already a Duke of Swabia, Frederick von Hohenstaufen. And so, Frederick von Hohenstaufen, who had been with Henry these last two years, had to go back home and take his remaining troops with him. And another member of Henry's entourage left, his eldest son Conrad. Conrad had lived in Italy for nigh on ten years by now, after his father had left him in the care of the Lombard bishops when he returned to Germany in 1084. He was now 20 years of age, and his father entrusted him with a very important mission. Henry's mother-in-law and Conrad's grandmother, Adelheid, Countess of Savoy, had died at the end of 1091. She was, like Matilda, one of these exceptional women who ran a state against all the laws and customs of the time. Her state was the Margraviate of Turin and the county of Savoy, in essence what is today the Italian province of Piemonte and the French region of Savoie. And most importantly, she controlled a number of alpine passes, including Montseny, which you may remember her daughter Bertha to bog and down. Adelheid had no heir in the male line and had designated one of her grandsons to inherit her lands. To Henry's annoyance, this grandson was not Conrad. But as emperor, he could determine the succession of his vassals should they die without direct male heirs. That was the law of the land but to enforce it an army needed to be deployed against the obstinate new Count of Savoy. Conrad was put in charge of that army and dispatched west. So far so good. Conrad campaigned gingerly around Asti and Turin until the summer of 1093. But then disconcerting news reached Henry at his camp in Verona. His own son had joined up with Matilda and Pope Urban II. What brought this treachery on has long been debated. Some later writers point out that Conrad was a bookish man who preferred reading over riding into battle. Some suggested that he had a falling out with his father over points of canon law and the claims of papal supremacy. The imperial propagandists, on the other hand, describe him as a feckless boy who had lent his ear to bad counsellors. Modern historians like I.S. Robinson and Egon Bosov attribute him with more political intelligence. Conrad saw his father's position deteriorating rapidly after the rout before Canossa. His army had shrunk and the ranks of his enemies were swelled by formerly loyal Lombard bishops and the emerging independent cities. And there was no way this could be resolved as long as Henry clung on to his antipope Clement III and Henry could not let go of Clement III because that would invalidate his imperial coronation. So Conrad may well have come to the conclusion that the only way the Salian house can remain in possession of power was if he would be crowned emperor by the right pope, i.e. Urban II. If that happened, he could fulfill the two conditions well of the fourth as set for lasting peace, which was setting aside Clement III and giving him the Duchy of Bavaria. Peace with Wealth the fourth and an arrangement with Urban II would end all conflicts and bring Conrad on the throne of a now united empire. Sounds like a plan. A plan Conrad went into without reservation. He met Pope Urban II in Cremona, and when the Pope approached, Conrad went out to meet him and there performed what is called the Office of the Groom. Conrad would get off his horse and he would take the papal bridle, guiding the Vicar of Christ into the city. The act of imperial submission to the papal authority had not been performed since the Emperor Louis II who was in fact no more than an Italian warlord. Allegedly, it had been introduced by the Emperor Constantine, who performed it for Pope Sylvester, after he had cured his leprosy by bathing him in the blood of young boys or some such nonsense. By performing the office of the groom, or Strator Dienst, Conrad accepts the Dictatus Pape of Gregory VII and becomes the vassal of the Pope. And from now, the Popes will demand the office of the groom at every imperial coronation. For Henry, this must have been a step through the heart. All he fought for was the preservation of the Salian rule he had inherited from his father and grandfather. His son joining the papal camp makes all that worthless. And this is not all. The next attack comes from his new wife. 
Empress Bertha, who had faithfully followed her husband to Canossa, had died five years earlier, and Henry had married Eupraxia, a Russian princess. This marriage seems to have been quite unsuccessful. Eupraxia does appear in only one charter during their entire marriage, which is a very low number compared to other Salian empresses, and even Henry's first wife, who at least appears quite regularly. That suggests she had little, if any, influence at court. Early in 1094, Eupraxia sent a plea for help to Matilda of Tuscany. Matilda sent a small elite force who extracted Eupraxia from the imperial court of Verona and brought her to Canossa. There she, quote, complained that she had suffered so many and so unheard of filthy acts of fornication with so many men as would cause even her enemies to excuse her flight, end quote. Eupraxia will repeat these allegations of gang rape by her husband's men in public at a papal synod in 1095, and they've been recounted again and again ever since. There's no way to determine the veracity of these statements since propaganda in the 11th century generally pays no regard to facts. And it does not matter. Henry had been betrayed by his son and accused of infernal crimes by his wife. His military position is now absolutely dire. His empire has shrunk to a couple of counties in northern Italy held by his ally, the Duke of Carinthia. He cannot return to Germany because his enemies control the Alpine passes. He cannot overcome his Italian enemies, whose numerical superiority is now overwhelming. It may well be that he contemplated suicide, or its 11th century equivalent, riding your horse into the middle of the enemy's melee. As Henry's star had sunk, Urban II is heading to the crowning moment of his papacy. On November 27, 1095, in a field outside the French city of Clermont, Urban II had gathered not just the bishops and magnates of the council, but also the local landowners, the castellans, their knights and the common people, the peasants, the artisans of the city, and even the urban poor. A barbaric fury has deplorably afflicted and laid waste the churches of God in the regions of the Orient, Urban declares, and this barbaric fury has even grasped in intolerable servitude its churches and the holy city of Christ, glorified by his passion and resurrection. He calls upon all to free the churches of the East and promises that if any man sets out from pure devotion, not for reputation or monetary gain, to liberate the Church of God at Jerusalem, his journey shall be reckoned in place of all penance. Deus volt, God wills it, is the crowd's response, not just in Clermont, but all across Europe. The Crusades have begun. Whilst Urban is making world history up in France, the Wheel of Fortune turns again, unexpectedly. You see, it's not just Henry's marriage that is on the rocks. The match that was made in heaven, or in the Lateran Palace, between Matilda and Ralph V had also run its course. The marriage that brought all this misery about in the first place is now over. We do not know who left who, but the bottom line is the same as in Matilda's first marriage. The lady is not for turning. Ralph V might be a strapping young lad, but that does not mean Matilda will leave him her lands or take his political advice. Matilda's life and work is bringing about her friend Gregory VII's vision of an all-encompassing and all-controlling papacy. And hence the heir to Matilda will be the one who had been her master all along, the Lord and his representative on earth, the Pope. Little wealth will get nothing. When this notion trickles through to the older Ralph IV, deposed Duke of Bavaria, he realized that everyone was in it for themselves. Time for Ralph to finally get something for himself. He opens negotiations with Henry and the two men quickly reach an agreement. Ralph IV offers fealty to the Emperor in exchange for the Duchy of Bavaria. There is no mention of Pope Clement III or the schism or church reform. Let's just bring this nonsense to an end. In spring 1097, Henry IV returns to Germany after seven years, most of which spent in despair and inactivity. He was so inactive that there is not a single imperial charter for the year 1094. None. Nada. Zilch. 
Next week, we will leave Henry to his own devices and talk a bit about the next great achievement of the Gregorian papacy, the First Crusade. We will talk about the horrors it unleashed for the Jewish communities in Germany, the misery it brought to the children and adults who walked all the way to Turkey, only to be mercilessly slaughtered by the Turks, and the armoured men who in the main went, not for pure devotion, but for reputation and monetary gain. I hope you will join us again. And in the meantime, should you feel like supporting the show and get hold of these bonus episodes, sign up on Patreon. The link is in the show notes or on my website at historyofthegermans.com. <laughs>